Before we get started, let's have a quick prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you we can be here this Sabbath day. We pray that your Holy Spirit will be here with us, that we may hear from the throne, not from human hands. Um, just give us a message. Give us something to take with us here today. And let us know that we've been to the house of God, that we've fellowshiped with the body of Christ. In my prayer in Jesus' name, amen. I, I presented some of this material back in 2008. I wasn't going to say anything, but I, I, got, I got to. Uh, the original title of the sermon, or the presentation, was Looking Back to Move Forward. Sounds familiar to anybody? <laughs> a little while ago, Ted, Ted Wilson preached a sermon with the same title, so I had to change it. So if you look in the bulletin, you see that it's been changed to something different. But when I presented this material originally, it's been revised a little bit now. Uh, the idea was, history isn't just history for history's sake. I mean, I like history, Adventist history. Part of my journey back into the church, you remember, I was running for 22 years. It took me 10 years to come back in. And it was a kind of a multi-stage thing. I started studying Adventist doctrine. Why Adventism? Why not the Baptist church down the street? And through that, as I was studying the doctrine, I realized that, you know, this church is a movement, and if God called this movement like we say he did, he called it in place and time, and we, we need to know our history. It would be beneficial. So I started studying Adventist history, and over the years I've, been, I've gotten pretty good at it because I, I read. And then we had moved out to Arizona. I was selling cameras, and someone I was working with was uh, telling me, hey, my pastor used to be a Seventh-day Adventist pastor. I said, what? And that entered me into my last third phase of study of apologetics. Now, for those who don't know, apologetics doesn't mean this is a field where we apologize. It comes from the Greek, and it simply means to, it's a defense of the faith. You can have Christian apologetics for Christianity in general, Adventist apologetics for Adventist doctrines, our belief, you can even have Ellen White apologetics. But I was in the field of apologetics, and that study, along with my others, is what brought me back into the church. The man that I initially came into contact with, his material, not him personally, had uh, said he, get, he sent flowers to the conference every year, thanking them that he found the truth and left the Adventist church. Well, it was through his material and my study of it that I came back to the church. I said I should send him flowers every year, thanking him for helping me to come back to the church. The only pro point is, is, problem is this. I was at the conference office when some of those flowers came one year. And he's not messing around. He's a beautiful flower. It's expensive. I can't afford it. I mean, I could send him a dandelion or something, but I can't send that kind of stuff. But when he said he sent flowers to the conference office every year, he wasn't kidding know because I've seen them but here I am and this material that we're going to cover today kind of lays at the core of why I'm a Seventh-day Adventist why I think you should be a Seventh-day Adventist and kind of fire up maybe this idea about what we are who we are you know and, and kind of get a purpose there and so what we're going to do is go back and give a little bit of the history talk a little bit about the founding, coming out of the Millerite, who William Miller was and coming out of that movement, and some of the, uh, some of the things that kind of really helped make us who we are. And really what helped make us who we are, you would think would be things like Sabbath, but it's not. I mean, there's Sabbath is in there as far as helping with, with some things that Joseph Bates did, but it's not Sabbath, State of the Dead, and stuff like that. And some of this stuff, you know, you can find other places. But it had to do with the core mission of the church, what we picked up for our reason to be Seventh-day Adventist. And so I hope to take us there on that a little bit, take us on, on that journey. Of course, Adventism, if you're going to talk about its history and where it starts, where does it start? Who does it start with? You didn't know it was going to be a test, did you? Starts with William Miller, right? We're all familiar with William Miller. I'm nodding my head. I, I hope we are. <laughs> William Miller, 
He was born in 1892 in Pittsfield. I had to stop thinking about (laughs) where he was born. (laughs) Pittsfield, Massachusetts. Uh, He was about four years old. The family found some cheap land up in uh, rural New York, up towards Lake Champlain. And so they moved up there. He had about 40 acres. Dad could farm and make a living. And that was his boyhood town, Low Hampton. That's where he grew up. Uh, he was educated at home, and when he was about nine, he went to the school about about four miles away in Pulteney, Vermont. And there was a little school there, public school that had opened. And he went there. And he didn't get much past the age of 18 as far as education goes. But he was largely self-taught. He would read books. He would borrow books from the local doctor and people who had personal libraries at home. And this helped him thrive. In fact, the doctor was willing to pay to send Miller away to school. But his father, a veteran of the Revolutionary War, a very proud man, said no. And what he couldn't give his son there, he gave his son for love of country, esprit de corps. Dad wasn't quite as religious as mom. Mom gave him religion. They were Baptists. So mom taught him how to be saved. Dad taught him how to love his country. And that was William Miller. He grew up. Uh, it was about 19, 1809, he married Lucy over in Vermont. Lucy uh, Smith moved there. And we know he did pretty well. Things I read said he had a house, some land, and two horses. So it was like having two cars. So he did pretty well. And the problem was, when he moved over into Vermont, he ran into some friends, good guys he liked. They were pretty moral characters, but they were deists. And he learned deism. They shared books with him, Humes and Payne and others. And so he became a deist. What's a deist? A deist was the 19th century form of atheism. It was easy to say, okay, there's a God. An atheist says there is no God. A deist would say there's a God. He just made the earth, got everything running, and set it in motion, and then he backs away. He's a God who is not interactive with his creation, does not intervene into the affairs of man. He just lets everything run. And for the most part, when you die, that's it. That's life. So it's a 19th century form of atheism. And the problem is, with, in his mind, he only had two views in. Annihilation and death, which petrified him. But then the other half petrified him, because if there's a God, it was judgment. Annihilation or judgment. These two things. <coughs> Now, through his life, he he rose in his community. He was a deputy sheriff. He was a justice of the peace. Uh, He came into about 32. He became captain of the militia right around the time of the uh, 1812 campaign. Uh, His uh, time in battle was uh, when he had taken his militia and joined with the official uh, U.S. Army. They made him a lieutenant. And he found himself at the Battle of Plattsburgh, which was north of where he lived. Uh, on Lake Champlain, 1814, in September. He noticed there at that battle that the Americans were outnumbered about five to one. So he knew, a good deist, good logic thinking, we're not going to win this war, this battle. It's too many. But after the battle, he saw some things. The Americans won, greatly outnumbered. And he knew that this wasn't right. He saw and felt that some, that the divine, the supreme being, he wasn't putting a name to it, had somehow stepped in and intervened, was looking over this new nation. It really rattled his cage as far as how he saw things. And that was the beginning. It wasn't his conversion, but it was the beginning of a pathway that would lead to his conversion within a few years. William Miller found himself back home. He came back to um, uh, Vermont, and he left there, came back to his boyhood town, built his house, uh, which is the classic Miller house if you ever look it up. In fact, it's an Adventist heritage place now, a museum. You can go there and look at it. This is the classic place. 
And he went back, his dad and sister had recently died, so he went back there to be close to his mother and take care of that and had siblings and things. So he's back there and, and is a good, dutiful son. Even though he's not fully into Christianity, he's still somewhat of the deist guy. Um, he goes to church with his mother. He takes her to the little chapel they have. Because uh, the Baptist preacher would come through about every six weeks. And they would go there, and when the preacher wasn't there, the elder would read from a book, a book of sermons. Get the picture? Shoot me now, right? And that had to be really boring. And uh, William had an offhanded comment to say to his mother, um, I could do better than that. Well, she put him to the test. And so she got him on the rotation. And it was up there when he was reading a sermon on parenting, child guidance or whatever, that he had an epiphany about a savior who would come and would give his life for someone. And that he had such a love for us. I mean, he was overwhelmed by the presence of, of Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. And this really had nothing to do with the sermon he was reading. Just the fact that he was in the presence. A lot of you might have had experiences like this when you're in your life, while you're sitting here today, while you're a follower of Christ. You may have had an experience where one day, unbeknownst to you, just out of the blue, Jesus steps in your path, knocks you down, asks the question, what are you going to do about me? Who do you say I am? And this is kind of like what, was, what had happened with Miller. This was a real conversion. Now, God had been working on him. This wasn't just a one-time deal. Previously, you know, he gives the example where he was walking down the street, and for, for some reason, he just took the Lord's name in vain, whatever. And as soon as he did it, he had never before had this happen, he felt convicted. God's working on him. But this experience really began to change him. And so he began to look at Scripture and make about a two-year study of the Bible. And his deist friends began to tease him. And they began to bring up all the arguments that they would bring up. He was all familiar with that. About why the Bible was wrong, etc. And he said, listen, let me study it verse by verse. And I'll get you an answer. And if I can't give you an answer, I'll be a deist still. Now he went back and did a form of study I don't recommend. He began with Genesis and he went verse by verse. And he said he wouldn't progress any further until he understood the verse where he was at. And then he would go to the next verse. Well, that's not the way to do Bible study, because sometimes that verse has a context, context later on down the text. And you've got to get down there and understand this back here. You know, immediate context isn't necessarily immediate. And I showed you in the book of Revelation where immediate context was two chapters away. So they're not always right next to each other. But this is how he progressed through. And as he got through and into the books of Daniel and stuff, through his study, we know what he's done, you know, as far as understanding chapter 7. That's next week on Sabbath school lesson, right? It's to teach that. Who's teaching Daniel 7? Okay. Right. So that followed with Daniel 8 and Daniel 9. That together gives us the 2300-day understanding, the prophecy and everything. tells us where we are in, in salvation history. And he was studying it, and of course we know his conclusions about the sanctuary. There was none in Jerusalem. There was no earthly sanctuary. And he's figuring, well, the sanctuary has to be earth. And if the sanctuary is going to be cleansed, then it's probably the earth that we know it's going to be cleansed by fire. So it has to be the end. Jesus is coming. And he figured by 1818, when he had finished the initial study, that uh, in about 25 years, the work to be filled up and Jesus will come. And so like a dutiful Bible student, he went out and told everybody, right? Wrong. He didn't do that. Thought he'd spend another seven years studying it just to be sure. It's during those seven years that it was interesting. <laughs> I, love, I love Pastor Mims. <laughs> I'm talking to you guys. This is, this is the these are the red-headed stepchildren over here. I've been ignoring them. So, <laughs> so <laughs> that, uh, this is one of the reasons why I generally don't like podiums right up in the middle. That way it kind of interferes with the flow. 
So I'll talk to these people here a little bit, okay? <laughs> so where, 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 where was I before, before I was interrupted? <laughs> so seven more years of Bible study, just to be sure, just to make sure he got it right. During that time, you know, the local doctor thought he was nuts. I think I've told the story here before. His daughter got sick. He calls the doctor over to examine her. He sits in the corner all quietly while he does the work and everything, checks her out, gives her medicine, whatever. And when he's done, he says to her, I want to talk to you. He said, you're not listening. I, I need to counsel with you. I'll pay the fee, he says. People had been saying that William Miller, the doctor especially, that William Miller had been a monomaniac. Mono, mono one. Otherwise, what that is to say, William Miller was normal like you and me, if we're normal. For all intents and purposes, he was okay. Until or unless you hit on that one point in his life that he would just be crazy. Monomaniac. And his end time scenario was what made him a monomaniac. And so he asked the doctor, he'd pay the fee, to uh, listen to him, and then you tell me if William Miller is a monomaniac, speaking about himself in the third person. He was two hours into it. He was giving him the full boat. And he says the doctor's face got pale. He got up and left the house. He didn't even finish the presentation. Two days later, the doctor came back knocking on the door. William Miller answers it. And the doctor's words were, Brother Miller, I fear I'm a lost man. This thing just tore the daylights out of him. This reminds me when I was a kid, a teenager studying prophecy. I was sharing with one of my friends who wasn't necessarily a church person about the trumpets and the, and the plagues and everything at the, in the book of Revelation. And I remember my brother coming back a few days later saying, hey, what did you say to Dale? Because he went home and had nightmares. You know? Whereas I was trying to share with him the good news of Revelation. You see, when we're in Christ, we're looking forward to this. If you're not in Christ, it's the other side. And this doctor saw himself lost. He was under, I, I'm a lost man. What you're telling me, I'm, I'm done. And Miller took him in, settled him down, talked to him. And he said that he was glad to report that the good doctor left his home every bit the happy monomaniac William Miller was. And so he had the message, he knew what he wanted to say, but he wasn't really out there presenting it. He was, after all, just a farmer. And then we know about that one Saturday morning in his study, there in August, 1830. And he's just looking up a piece of history, and in the back of his head, he hears his voice like this, this the words coming to him, the pressure, go tell it to the world. And he couldn't shake it. And he keeps making deals with God. You know I'm not a preacher. No one has ever asked me to speak before. You know this isn't what I do. I'm just a farmer. Go tell it to the world. And finally he makes that deal with God. Okay, guys? Make deals with God. He likes that because he'll test you on it. He says, okay, I'll tell you what. I'll preach the message, if someone comes and asks me, and they ask me to speak on it specifically, that message. No one's asked him before. And he said the pressure left him. He felt at ease. There was no longer this thing to go tell it to the world. And he settled down. And within a half hour, he got to knock on the door. It was, actually, it was his nephew. From, from Dresden, about 12, 16 miles away. I forgot how far away he was. I read something where it said the kid had to, have, of course, he was already on his way when Miller made the deal with God, and he had to take several conveyances, I guess, anything from a rowboat down to a horse or whatever. The kid it took him a while to get down there. So he got down there, and he tells William Miller, Father, who was evidently the elder at the church, says the preacher won't be there tomorrow and wants to know if you'll come and preach, invitation, on what you've been studying in Daniel, specific. Now, you know William Miller really didn't want to preach. 
And when this came to him, when God took him up on his offer, William Miller was not happy. He didn't say, oh, God bless, man, God met my, I'm going to go do this thing. And no, he was very angry. And he stomped out the back door without a word. His little daughter, and, and they had a habit of naming their kids after wives in those days. You don't see that as much today. I have a niece named after her mom. Little Lucy would follow him around like a pet, pet dog. But she started to follow him out the door and then turn toward the kitchen. Said, something's the matter with Daddy. She could tell. And he went out to their little grove of maples I think they had in the back and spent about 20 minutes or so fighting with God, fighting with the call. Should I, should I not? I don't, you know this isn't what I was called to do. Uh, in the movie, Tell the World, you've seen the little movie they have out there on Adventist history? You can get them at the ABC. It's pretty cheap, about five bucks. I think this may be a little over-dramatized, but hey, get the point home. Uh, the, word, the, the way the saying goes is William Miller went into the grove a, a farmer. William Miller came out a preacher. And he came back in, packed his bags. And he was started preaching. They had a revival. And he was without an invitation ever since. He always had an invitation to speak somewhere regarding what he had been studying. And he would go out and speak. He would go out and speak on his own expense. Of his whole career of speaking, he kept a little book about how much money was given to him. You know, you know, when I go out and have to travel somewhere, people help with my gas, you know, if I'm really driving. So any money they give him, he writes down. The whole time he preached, from 1830 to 1844, he got four, I think it was four bucks, the whole time period. So he paid for his own expenses, and he would go. First 10 years, it was just rural community. You can't hard to get the message out. But he ran across a man named Josiah von uh, uh, Himes, J. J. V. Himes, Joshua V. Himes, who was the pastor of a Christian Connection Church in Boston, the, the Chardon Mission or something like that, where he was at. He had heard him. He liked what he was saying. He wasn't 100% convinced, yet he helped publicize him. Started a newspaper in 1840. He wasn't, con uh, uh, Joshua V. Himes came fully on board in 1842. So about a year and a half or so in there, when he was working with Miller, he liked what he was saying, and then he came fully on board. But he supported him as a publicist, because he was a publicist. So he had a little paper out, Signs of the Times. And this brought William Miller out of the woodwork, out of the small towns into the big, big cities. And not just that, but William Miller was the only one virtually preaching. He didn't have other preachers preaching this message. So it was one man trying to give it to the world. But now that all changed. From 1840 to 44, it became multi. Various preachers were out preaching this message, not just one. And it became big cities, not just rural communities. And the message took off like wildfire. And they heard numbers from 50,000 to 100,000 and more were Millerites by the time of 1844. Miller, you know, never set a date. I still read that stuff where Miller sets a date. Miller went out preaching that Christ was coming on October 22, 1844, in 1830s when he started that. And it's not so. He believed that Christ was coming in or about 1843, according to his initial work. In 1840, with the pressures of Joshua V. Himes, uh, other people who joined him, like the theologian Josiah Litch, other pastor, pastors like Charles Fitch, and people that were around him, now he started having people around him saying, hey, you need to be a little more concise about when Jesus is expected to come. So, <laughs> bless you. So, to, to be concise, he says, okay, what we'll do is this will say that Jesus will come during the Jewish year between 1843 and 44. And that was the closest he ever set a date. It was the Jewish calendar from 43 to 44. After the spring of 44, when Jesus didn't come, there was a disappointment. Some people left the movement. Some went back to their home churches. Some gave up Christianity altogether. 
But they rallied a bit, and they said, this is the tarrying time. They went to Habakkuk 2, where it was, write the vision plain on stone so that he who reads it may run. Though the vision tarry, wait for it. But the vision, he says in Habakkuk, does not tarry. You know, vision comes right on time. And so they wait. This was the tarrying time. And come that fall, that the late summer there in August at Exeter camp meeting, the message came. Joseph Bates was up front talking, asking if anybody had any comments or ideas about where to go with the movement right now. And some lady stood up and said, uh, my, my brother, I think it was her brother or cousin, has the answer. He has something to say. And Joshua and, and Samuel S. Snow come riding in on a horse and, you know, like, there to save the day. And so he had word, and they waited the next day. He came out fresh to present the message. And he presented a message that William Miller, interestingly, had written about several months earlier. As he made the comparisons between the uh, fall, and, uh, the spring and the fall types, where the first advent of Christ had fulfilled the spring types. Right on time. Remember, Christ was crucified right at the time of the, of the sacrificing of the Passover lamb. He raised on Sunday morning, wave chief. I mean, he met type, met anti-type right on. So if that was for the first advent, the second advent, Snow was saying, is going to be met right on time. All the, all the types will be met by the anti-type. And of course, Yom Kippur was the day for the second coming. Now that year, the Jews, rabbinical Jews, celebrated September 23rd because they used a calendar calculation. The Karaite Jews, who were more biblical, they didn't believe in the oral tradition, like saying the Catholic Church has the oral and biblical. R rabbis, the rabbinical Judaism has an oral and written tradition as well. Karaite Jews do not. They're Bible people. Only the Tanakh. It's got to be in the Word. And they use the sighting of the crescent moon. They don't calculate calendars. They look for the moon. And so through their calculations is how they would set the time on when the feasts were. But however, the Karaites were a kind of a global group at that time. And so that year, they used the rabbinical year, September 23rd, for their Yom Kippur. But Samuel Snow evidently thought that that year, whatever calculations, I have not seen anything in his writings where he speaks about it, but the Jews would have, using the calculations of the, of the new moon, would have, every, every so often, would have leap year. Well, actually, leap month. They'd put a new month in. And the reason why is because you only had three, you had 12 months of, of, of 30 days, 360 days a year. Well, that's five days plus shy. You know, so after a while, your, your calendar is going to drift. And, you know, when Jesus rose, they had to take a sheaf of barley into the holy place and wave it. Well, you've got to have a sheaf of barley to wave. And so they would check the barley to see if it was a bib, if it was ready to go. And if it wasn't going to be ready for Passover, you added another month. And that took all the festival days and moved them down a month. And so evidently, Snow felt that this was leap year, and that September 23rd wasn't the day that indeed October 22 would be the new Yom Kippur. Now, that might be a little far because I've looked at our history, and I don't think we've ever had another Yom Kippur that late in October, even with the Karaite Jews. And I have a friend who's a Karaite Jew, and he does the Abib. He goes out and does there in Jerusalem, checks it for ripe, uh, if it's ripe, so they can set the calendar. And I'm looking at his history. He's done it for over 20 years. I don't see anything. I see October dates. And I think the closest I've got to 22 was maybe around the 14th or so. I haven't gotten to 22. But Snow says October 22 is Yom Kippur, based off the Karaite method of calculating the calendar. And so that was the new Spree de Corps. That was the new fire. So you had William Miller starting in 1830, preaching the message in rural communities. 1840, it went to large cities and took on a bigger uh, stance there, a bigger platform. 
And then in 1844, you have the last few months from August to October, hot. And it was referred to as the seventh month movement. Why? Because Yom Kippur takes place on the seventh Jewish month. And so this was the seventh month movement where the message went out like the leaves of autumn. Very hot across the field. New spirit of core. We know what happened on October 22, don't we? Some people today believe that Jesus did come, but he came spiritually. Others have picked up on that theology, and, and there's another religion out there that's based off that same failed theology, where Jesus had come spiritually. Except now they've, they've calculated up to 1914 that he came. But we know that Jesus didn't come. And so this is where we are here, the following morning. That's the day of disappointment, not October 22. In uh, a little farm south of Rochester, New York, what's called Upper New York, was a farm owned by uh, Hiram Edson. He had a young protege lived with him. He was, he was a school teacher, about 20, 20 years old, O.R.L. Kreuzer, and friends with Dr. Frank Hahn. Together they had their little nucleus there with the Millwright message. And that following morning, they were weep, weeping, they were sad. He said, we, we wept until day dawn because Christ had not come. And so they gathered together in the barn to pray, to ask God's guidance. What's the message? What's going on? After that, they went and had a little breakfast. And um, Hiram says, we're going to go and look at, for the other Adventists out there who have been disappointed and kind of help cheer them up. Uh, but I think instead of taking the main road, where he would have been jeered at a little bit by others who seen he hadn't gone up yet, he crosses the cornfield. O.R.L. Oh, Kreuzer is with him, younger man, he's running ahead of him. And he noticed that uh, Hiram got stopped in the field in the back. Now some people have read this as if Hiram had a vision. And I don't think he had a vision. I think he had an epiphany. I think it dawned on him what they had been doing, what he had been praying for, I think God spoke to his heart, and he saw it. In his mind's eye, he says, I looked up and saw Christ going into the heavenly sanctuary, not the earth. The sanctuary is not on the earth, it was in heaven. This was the beginning of what would become the sanctuary doctrine. O.R.L. Kreuzer asked him what he was doing. He says, I'm receiving an answer to this morning's prayer. And they studied it out and published it in their own little self-published paper called the, Days, the, the Day Dawn. And it only went to about 300 people. It was published in uh, uh, 1845, around March. And it didn't have much impact. In the following year, in 46, they thought they would rewrite, they revised, uh, revised it, enlarged it, and paid special. I think uh, um, uh, Hiram Edson's wife sold some silverware for that. A special edition of the Day Star. The Day Star used to be called the Midnight Cry. It was an old Millwright paper that Enoch, Enoch Jacobs had. And they published it there in around March or February or March, I think it's February of uh, 46. And it was there that Ellen White recommends, it was a special edition that she said she could recommend to other people. There it gives light to what our experience was. Uh, and she came to, to note, because this was a paper that was kind of used as a, um, a place where various views could be shared. And she had shared her vision in the first, uh, in, the, in the newspaper before the special edition, and he published it against her will, so she had to send some more information to clarify things, and he published that in the edition following. So sandwiched between was the, uh, the paper on uh, Enoch, on, on uh, Hiram Edson's and Kreuzer's understanding of the sanctuary. It's called the Law of Moses. And that was the only one extent for a long time until Marilyn Burke found the original copy in, uh, in Canadagra uh, and published it around 92, 93 in Adventist University Studies. So this 
was the beginning of the process of where God was beginning to take us. And the uh, formation was the sanctuary. What were we doing? What was, what was the essence of, um, of what was happening here? And the essence was that God was trying to show them something different because Hiram Metzen knew that Christ went in, he said he went into the sanctuary there to do a work before he would come back. So now we're looking for Christ to come eminently. That's at any moment. He would come any second. He had the work to do. He'd finish and come get us. Today, we've moved from that. We don't teach eminent return. That's dispensationalism. Christ could come by your next breath. He could be here. Adventism says, no, no, these things have to happen first. So Christ's coming could be soon, could be very soon, but not eminent. Not the next moment, not before we walk out those doors. So that's, so it's been modified a bit. But at that time, it was eminent. Christ could come at any moment, is what they were teaching. And so this was the beginning of the groups that would begin to understand what was happening. From this group here, we had, of course, the birth of um, the Sabbath commandments that had come in through Frederick Wheeler in Washington, New Hampshire, and how he had become the first Sabbath-keeping Millerite before 1844 Disappointment Day. So technically, he was our first Seventh-day Adventist minister, you could say. Uh, up the road a bit, a free, way, uh, a, a free will Baptist named uh, T.M. Prebo heard about it, wrote an article, he accepted it, wrote an article, a little temp, actually published in a little magazine, a newspaper, and then they made a tract in March of 45. And this little tract circulated around. It made its way to Maine. It was uh, used to convert uh, a young teenager named J.N. Andrews to the Sabbath. And um, it was found its way down to Bedford, New, down to New Bedford, Fairhaven area. New Bedford had divided into two little towns during the, during the Revolutionary War. And uh, to a man named Joseph Bates. And he read it and put fire under him. But he had to go up and talk to the people up there in Washington, New Hampshire. So he took a train and a stagecoach and did a lot of walking. He got there at 10 o'clock at night the night, you know, the day he got there, and went in and spent the rest of the evening talking with Frederick Wheeler about the Sabbath. They prayed in the morning, then they went over to uh, uh, Cyrus uh, Farnsworth, over to his home. He was a big supporter of the little church there. And he, if you ever read Farnsworth, um, the um, one son's name was uh, uh, William. And William in his 22. Remember that book? It's not his 22 rifles, it's 22 kids. Now, that's all that same family. And they all got into the ministry, Adventist ministry, missionaries, pastors, nurses, <laughs> the whole thing. So he went over to Farnsworth and they spent there. So Miller goes back, I mean, Bates goes back home, convic convicted of the Sabbath. And from there, he writes his first pamphlet. So he really becomes the propagator of the Sabbath message. As we begin to gather together, and these Millerite groups began to gather in these little meetings. And he would teach them the Sabbath. He got together with Hiram Edson and et cetera there in, in uh, New York, Port Gibson area. And they received the Sabbath. He'd meet with people over in Maine. They'd receive the Sabbath. By 1846, he presented his little book, his new book, Hot Off the Press, to uh, James White and Ellen Harmon. And they said no. Or they took the book, but they disagreed with him on the Sabbath. And, but we know by that August they got married, and by October they're Sabbath keepers. So now this thing is growing. And we have two major pillar doctrines developing right before our eyes. The sanctuary doctrine, understanding what's happening there, and the Sabbath. And the other, doc the other pillar doctrine, dealing with the state of the dead, that came in through jo uh, James White and Joseph Bates. They were Christian connection. You know, remember the Christian church during the 1800s. That was part of the restorationist movement. We're going to restore the primitive Christianity. The only problem was they couldn't get away from Constantinian Christianity. But the idea was there. And through that, this group broke off, the Christian connection, because of the Trinity doctrine. And, you know, they, they were Arian. 
and because of the state of the dead. They were conditionalists. James and Joseph Bates were both con connection people. They brought in conditionalism to the Adventist group. So our pillar doctrines are quickly forming right there before our eyes. And of course, the second coming, the fourth pillar, and the doctrine and theology of the coming was already being forced through the Millerite movement. And this is where Bates, our first theologian, would really begin to develop the key to what would be the foundation of Adventism. And that was his understanding of the mission and message, which has to do with the three angels, as he began to look at that um, through there. Let's go with me to Revelation 14, so you can see that there. Revelation 14, 6 to 12 is the three angels' message. Now, William Miller looked at it a little differently. At first, he said that the first angel was preached by William Miller. The second angel, that Babylon had fallen, and for the message connected with 18, chapter 18, verse 4, come out of her, my people, was preached by Charles Fitch. And as they were coming out of the churches, based on that message, he says 1844 occurred. I mean, the third angel's message occurred because it was the message that went out for those who rejected the call out of Babylon would be the ones who would receive the punishment. So Bates had understood that all first three messages, eight, one, two, and three, occurred before October 22, 1844. And that now after that date was the propagation of present truth, the Sabbath. And that's what he was, that's how he began to see it. James White says, I kind of see where you're coming from, but... He saw that the second angel took him up to 1844 and that after 1844 date of October 22, we are now in the third angel's message. And that's why typically you hear the Adventist where it says third angel as if it's just the third angel. You know, this is the third angel's message. Both kind of agreed with that, but quickly through extra study, they begin to realize more that these aren't just three secular messages, that they're continuous. And we begin to realize that the first message starts and goes to the end. The second message starts at a later date and continues to the end. And same with the third. At one point, all three are going to be going together. And Ellen White was very clear on that when she says, we have to present all of them, not just one message out of context. Begin with all three. She was influenced by it such uh, at the time, that she wrote this, you find this in Life Sketches 196, with the combination here of the, how, how the three angels was being worked out. Having traveled over every step of advance to our present standing, I can say praise God. As I see what the Lord has wrought, I am filled with astonishment and with confidence in Christ as leader. We have nothing to fear for the future, except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us, and his teaching in our past history. And that last part's real familiar to us. I know a lot of people have heard that one, that quote. But it's in the context of what Joseph Bates had done on giving the message about what the three angels is. Now he may have started off a little bit on the one side, but he actually laid that foundation, that ground, that really helped us to begin to see and crystallize just what it was that God had called us for. And this is where the three angels' messages become so foundational to the Adventist mission and message. It is the last message to go out into the world. After that, in Revelation 14, is the second coming. There's nothing after it. This is it. This is the message that the world needs. The main message is in the first angel. It's a message of salvation, judgment, and worship. Salvation, eternal salvation, only one gospel. It's in, a it's in a message of judgment, which is not just condemnation, but that God is restoring justice in an unjust world. He's now stepping upon the stage of action. He is finishing up. Remember, we're moving the kingdom from darkness to light. This is the coming in of the kingdom, and we are citizens of that kingdom. And then the third phrase, to worship him who made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. 
We're to worship creator God. And that's the heart of the message that we're to give to the world. That's a great message to give to the world. Amen. And it's a great message to be an Adventist. Amen. The second message, you know, Babylon has fallen. That's simply telling to the world that God's work is now accomplishing what it's supposed to be doing. Amen. That his kingdom has triumphed. Amen. That's the message. It's not just a negative message to tell the world about the fall of Babylon and for us to step on their necks, but to declare that God's kingdom is now triumphed, that we are moving in to that new time. Amen. And then the third message is the call to worship. Don't receive the mark. You worship true creator God, chapter 14, not this false system we read about in chapter 13. You know, the land beast makes an image to the first beast, and then the world follows after it. This is a false system. This is the Baal worship. And we're to call people to worship creator God. And we have a great message as a people. And it's grounded in our history, who we are. It's not just something of today, but what God had started long ago. And whatever you understand about the 2300 days and all that's involved with it, know this. That the 2300 days puts us where we are in salvation history. So that we know we're at the proper time in salvation history to run with the message we have in the three angels. Otherwise, we might say, are we running too soon? Are we running ahead of ourselves? And the answer is no, because we know where we are in salvation history. And we know what the message is that's going to go out into the world to restore the kingdom of life, to put things back the way they were. The book of... The whole Bible, the first three chapters tell about the fall and how everything got messed up. Last three chapters tell how everything's going to be restored. And that's where we're headed to. And that's what you and I are part of. It's our privilege to be part of that. And share that message. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this great message that you've given us to give to others. And to start to share with others about what Christ has done for us. I mean, that's where we begin. We have to begin with our own experience with you. And when we share with other people who are real human beings just like we are, who have problems just like we do, hey, can I share with you what Jesus has done for me? To begin there to show that the restoration of the kingdom, the eternal kingdom, is there for them too. And they can have hope. Thank you, Father, that we are blessed with this message. And help us to go forth to be a blessing to others. In my prayer in Jesus' name, amen.